Welcome back to week three of Life of a Jesus Follower. Today I want to start a little bit differently. You know, normally I open with some sort of a story that is designed to capture your attention and to help prepare you for where it is that we're headed. But today I want to introduce you to Vance Pittman and give you a chance to hear some of his story. My prayer is this morning that that would really resonate with your heart and that it would help prepare you for where it is that we're about to go. Because today, let me just give you a little bit of warning, is a difficult conversation. So let's check out a little bit about Vance Pittman's story. Amen. I became a follower of Jesus when I was in college. Now, I had been raised in a Christian environment. I was raised in and around the church, but it wasn't until I was a freshman in college that I began a personal relationship with God. But because I'd grown up in and around Christianity, when I became a Christian, a follower of Jesus, when I began a relationship with God, I made a serious mistake. And here's what I mean by that. I began to equate spiritual maturity with spiritual activity. Meaning the more stuff I did for Jesus, the more I felt Jesus was happy with me. I I felt like Jesus had done so much for me in saving me that it was now my responsibility to begin to live the Christian life. And so I set out on this journey of trying to be a good Christian. I read a quote by a man named Henry Blackaby that really epitomized the first decade of my Christian journey. It's, he, he said this, he said, we are, sa- we are so activity oriented that we assume we are saved for a task to perform rather than for a relationship to enjoy. That's where I was living. I thought Jesus did so much for me. Now it's up to me to live for him. It's my responsibility. And so for the first decade of my Christian life, I tried hard to be a good Christian. I tried to measure up to what I thought God expected of me. And and based on my performance, that was the operative word, my performance as a Christian, my emotion rose and fell. I felt like there was a report card that I would receive from God based on how I measured up to being a good Christian. There were even verses in the Bible that made no sense to me because I was trying so hard to be a good Christian and yet I would come to a gathering like this in a church and I'd look around at everybody else and figure out or try to figure out how do they all have it all together and I'm the only one that's messed up. I would look at them, you know, we come at church on Sunday and we got our Sunday face on, like we got it all together, man, we're doing everything right and how you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing great, everything's good in my life. And I'd look at that and I would think I was the only one who was broken. Let me give you an example of the verses that made no sense to me. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus, or Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you, I've underlined some words for you, say it out loud. Oh, that's a good word, amen. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, so you may find rest for your souls. For my yoke is, say it out loud, and my burden is, let's let's just say the three underlined words out loud. You ready? One, two, three. (laughs) You could not have picked three words further removed from my experience of Christianity than rest Easy. And are you kidding me? And don't look at me spiritual, all right? If you'd have said, hey, Vance, why don't you pick three words to describe your Christianity? I would have said work, hard, and heavy. That's what Christianity felt like to me. I'd entered into this relationship with Jesus, and now it's hard work for me to carry the heavy load of being a good Christian, and I'm supposed to work as hard as I can to do that. Show you another verse. Jesus said in John chapter 8, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you 
Oh, anybody want some freedom today? Listen, I didn't have freedom. I just exchanged one set of bondage for another set of bondage. I was now trying to measure up. I was trying to perform. I was trying to live up to a standard that was completely unattainable. And then to make matters worse, by this point in my Christian journey, I was already pastoring. So I'm preaching this gospel and I'm saying words like easy light and free and rest. And I'm hoping somehow they just got it more than I got it. And long story short, it led me to a point of brokenness in my own life spiritually. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know what I mean when I say a place of spiritual brokenness. It's one of those moments when God kind of knocks the props out from under you. He removes that which makes you comfortable. And you get to a place of real desperation for him. And it was in that moment of desperation that I came to the greatest discovery of my life, and that is that Jesus is enough. Wow. Have you ever felt like that? That you were just trying so hard and nothing just seemed to make any sense to you? Well, I hope that you've grabbed your Bible, something to write with, and something to write on, maybe even your Jesus follower devotionals, and let's get ready to gather, grow, and go. We are obsessed, curious, distracted, and fixated. Like an accident on the side of the road, we can't look away. Something or someone has our attention. We are followers, and we are all following something. Sports teams, political candidates, natural disasters, breaking news, financial markets, technology trends, famous people. The list never ends. What is your curious obsession? Who or what are you following? Is Jesus on your list? Does he turn in and out of your thoughts? Is he a consideration of who you are and what you do? He should be. Let your heart catch fire with what it means to be a Jesus follower. Your life will never be the same. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 3. While you're flipping there, let me just catch you back up just a little bit. Because over the last two weeks, we've learned that the life of a Jesus follower is all about relationships. Last week, we dove into the first relationship that Jesus had, and really that we should have. And that is Jesus' relationship and our relationship with God the Father. Now, we said that the goal... The end zone, if you will, of the Christian life is to know God. And we said the way that we move the ball down the field is to daily spend time with him. And I want to say it just a little bit different today. And that is that growing is knowing. And by knowing, I don't mean some sort of intellectual pursuit or intellectual understanding of who God is. That's not what knowing is. Go back to week one. If you missed it, please go back because we had a long discourse about what knowing really means. But here's the other thing. I don't want you to put this idea of a daily, daily spending time with God into some sort of shoebox of a devotional or a quiet time or what Bible study, whatever it is that you want to call that, that personal time that you spend with God every single day, um, that's good. The, those things are really good. And they're the, the foundation, they're, they're the basic building blocks of this idea of spending time with God. But growing and knowing, it is something so much more than a quiet time. It's so much more than something that you do. It's living moment by moment out of the overflow of the relationship with Jesus Christ, right? We, we said this idea last week. The primary call on my life is not to do something for Jesus, 
The primary call on my life is to be with Jesus. So if that's the primary call on my life, if growing and knowing is all tied up in this, then why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to spend time with God? You know, a few weeks ago, my family got a, a new to us hot tub. We had been researching since before COVID and had been saving up to be able to, to get one and to do this. We were excited about it, had the, the pad all laid down, had um, done all the preparations, had a, the electrical, which we had to run from this side of the house all the way through the attic space and over to the other side of the house. It wasn't an easy thing to do. Um, but when we finally found the right hot tub, we were so excited about this and could not wait to get it in. And so the day that it got delivered and we got it all hooked up and together, we began to fill it up with water. And we were so excited just to be in that hot tub. It was amazing. Next morning, we came out to check on, on things and to, to run the processes that they taught us to do. And we noticed there was a leak. It was coming off of one of the, the corners of the hot tub. So we opened up the panels to, to see, and sure enough, drip, 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 there it was. One of the pipes was dripping some water off of it. So we called the hot tub repair guys, and they're like, well, hey, listen, we'll have to send somebody out to come, to come and look at this. So the guy comes out, he flashes his light around inside and says, well, here's the only thing I can do is we're gonna have to drain the hot tub, and then we'll have to put some silicone around this, and you'll have to let that dry for about 24 hours, and then you can fill the hot tub back up again and be in it. Hey, whatever we gotta do to get this thing fixed, that's what we wanna do. So, guy drains it all, fixes it. We wait 24 hours, oh, 24 painfully hard hours, and fill it back up. We were so excited to be able to be back in the hot tub again. It was so great. And the leak was still there. Oh my goodness. So we called the hot tub people back. We said, listen, there's still a leak on this. They said, well, we're gonna have to order a new part. We said, oh man. He said, we're gonna have to drain it again. So you just will go ahead and drain it now, let it all dry out. And then when we get there, we'll cut that piece out. We'll clear everything. We'll put the new piece in. We'll seat it really well. We'll silicone it up so that you won't have any more leaks. Great. Let's do that. And so here it is. We have this hot tub that is sitting out there that we can't be in because of this silly broken piece that keeps leaking. It's awful. And I think it may be more torture now being able to see something that we can't be in than when we were just dreaming about what it is that we wanted to have out there. You know, I think the same, though, is true about our spiritual lives. That we can't be in a relationship with God when something is broken. So what breaks our relationship with God? What keeps us from being in relationship with him? Well, hopefully you found Genesis chapter three by now. And I, I know that Genesis is not one of the four gospels. It's not where the, the story of Jesus's life, death and, and resurrection is found at, but it is at the very beginning. In fact, Genesis actually means beginning. And, and the story that we're gonna pick up in today is after man and woman have already been created. In fact, they were created good in the image of God. They've been placed in the garden. They've been placed in authority over all things that are there in the garden. They've been given one rule to follow, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they've been given a relationship with God. And one day, the woman finds herself in a conversation with the serpent. And that's where we're going to pick our story up in chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed some fig leaves together 
and they made themselves some loincloths. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and he said to him, where are you? Wow, so much in this passage. And I want to encourage you this week, especially if you're in a group, to spend some time dissecting this with them. So much good stuff here. But I want to point out just a couple of things real quick. Here's number one. They, being Adam and Eve, saw that the tree was desirable for making one wise. Okay, I find this so interesting. Because we've already said in this series that we struggle with knowing and doing versus being. And here it was that Adam and Eve just had to be with God. They didn't have some sort of laundry list of do's and don'ts that they were supposed to be engaged with. They were just supposed to be with him. And yet they traded that very being for knowing. And I don't mean some sort of like personal relationship sort of knowing. I mean intellectual knowledge of God. Here's the second one. They hid themselves after they broke the relationship. So Adam and Eve instantly understood the difference between being in relationship with God and being outside of relationship with God because their disobedience or sin had broken the relationship between them and God. So What breaks our relationship with God? Sin. Sin keeps us from a relationship with God. I love one of the things that Wikipedia has to say about sin. Who says Wikipedia can't be helpful? It says this, anything that alienates one from God could be termed sinful. So the thing that keeps us from a relationship with God is sin. Now that shouldn't really surprise you because if you've ever done something that is wrong, right? Your natural reaction, my natural reaction is to hide, right? I, I hid all kinds of things from my parents. I, I bet you did too. Of course you did. But you know, it seems like my parents always figured out when I was hiding something. And as a parent now, I figured out that it's because the relationship between us would change. That's what sin does. Now, if you've been around church for any length of time, maybe you grew up in it, maybe you've been gone for a while and you're just coming back, or maybe not, but maybe you've heard about the origin of this word, sin. And sin is a Latin word, and it literally means to miss the mark. It was used in archery. And if you didn't hit the bullseye, then you were said to have sinned the arrow. So anything less than perfection was sinning. Romans 3.23 says it like this, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standard. That's pretty harsh. Paul is, Paul's calling us all out. He's saying that we're not perfect, that we're all sinners. And I could try to lay out some sort of standard as to what sin is, but really that's pretty hard to argue against. If the standard is perfection, I mean, we could try to claim that we're good people, but nobody's perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And so there it is. We're sinners. We've missed the mark. But it gets worse because David says this. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. That's a word that means sins. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, another word that means sins, and cleanse me from my sin. So three times he said sin. For I know my transgressions, again sin, and my sin is ever before me, and it's against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. 
So God, you're justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth. In other words, I was born in iniquity or sin. And in sin did my mother conceive me. So David says that not only does he sin, but he sins because it is part of his human nature. David seems to be saying that we're born this way. And I kind of have to agree with him. I mean, nobody used to teach us how to be disobedient or how to cheat or to steal or to lie or to be selfish. We kind of just know how to do it. In fact, this is the theological idea of depravity. The doctrine of total depravity says that people are, as a result of the fall, not inclined or even able to love God wholly with their heart, mind, and strength, but rather we are inclined by our nature to serve our own wills and desires and to reject God's rule. And because you and I were born into sin, and because we continue to make our own choices that are sinful, that alienate us from God, we desperately need Jesus. You see, we talked about it last week that Jesus came to give an invitation and to be a a bridge, if you will, between us and God and to restore that relationship. But even as Jesus followers, we still struggle with sin. In fact, check out what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very things that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am in agreement with the law, which is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. You ever felt like that? Yeah, me too. And here's the problem. Sin not only keeps us from the ultimate goal of knowing and having a relationship with God, but sin keeps us from that daily goal of spending time with God. Sin keeps us from spending time with God. So with all of that in mind, I want to ask you three questions today. Now, before I ask these questions, I just want to preface this with, number one, don't type in your answer. Number two, don't yell out your answer, right? Because it may not be what you think. Here's the first question. Does a Christian want to sin? You know, I I really loved listening to Vance pigeonhole himself a little bit as he tried to answer this question. So I want to let you watch him struggle for just a moment about this idea about does a Christian want to sin? Well, I'd ask me that question sitting across the desk from me. And I was fresh out of seminary. And I didn't even hardly let him finish the question until I was answering it. Well, of course. I mean... That's why it's tempting, right? Temptation would not be temptation if I did not want to sin. So, of course, Clyde, of course as a Christian, I want to sin. And he let me talk myself into this hole. And then he began to just lead me out of that by helping me understand. In one sense, yes, it's true. In our flesh, as long as we are human beings on this earth, we are going to struggle with sin. We will. We have a flesh. Listen, don't let the enemy convince you somehow that you've gotten to a place spiritually where you're above it because you're not. 
Our flesh is not getting better. It's getting worse. Our flesh still longs for the things of this world. But listen, we are no longer our flesh. Christ has come to live inside of us. Christ has given us a new heart, a new being. And now on the inside, no, we as Christians genuinely don't want to sin. And let me prove it to you. As soon as you do, how does it feel? As soon as the Christian makes that choice to disobey God, here's what we discover immediately. That's not what I wanted at all. That matches really well with what Paul said earlier, that we do things that we don't really want to do. And we do them because of our sin natures. But we know pretty quickly that they're not the things that we want to be doing. So that brings me to our second question. Does a Jesus follower have to sin? Now, before you answer, let's read a couple of other things that, that Paul wrote. Same guy who struggled and, and identified with the same things that we identify with. Let's read a couple of things that he said. In Galatians 2.20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, for all of you that love and grew up on the King James Version, I love how it says right here that I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So good. Romans 6 says this. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, same idea out of Galatians, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Oh, I love that. It's so good. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, And God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. That verse gets misquoted so often. We think that it means that God will never give us more than we can handle. But you know, Paul in Romans chapter 5 says that we're only able to stand because of grace that's been given to us through Jesus. And Paul's not the only one who, who gets this idea. Peter, check out what, what he says. This, this is the same Peter that was Jesus' disciple, the same Peter that failed to walk on water, the same Peter that failed to stand alongside of Jesus when Jesus was on trial. This Peter writes this. He says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything, everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. In other words, Jesus has given us everything that we need to be able to live and to follow him as a Jesus follower. When we responded to the call, when we responded to the invitation, we got it all, everything. So does a Christian want to sin? No. Does a Christian have to sin? No. Okay, if that's the case, then you should just get ready because this is going to be gut-wrenching. This is going to be toe-clenching. This is going to this is going to hurt just a little bit. Because if we don't have to sin, and if we don't want to sin, then why do we sin? John 14:15, Jesus says, "If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You probably hear this the same way that I've heard this for lots and lots of years. Jesus saying, if you love me, then you'll do everything in your power 
to keep my commandments, in order to prove to me that you love me. But is that really what Jesus is saying? Or is Jesus saying, if you love me, then you'll be able to keep all of my commandments. If you love me, love me, and you'll be able to. See the difference? One of those focuses on the obedience as a demonstration of the love. And the other one, it focuses on the love and the obedience comes as a fruit of that love. Let me say that again. Obedience is not the focus of the life of a Jesus follower. Obedience is the fruit of the life of a Jesus follower as I focus on intimacy with God. So why do I sin? Well, according to Jesus, I sin because I don't love God. Now, Don't mishear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that if you sin that you don't love God. I'm not even saying that if you sin you hate God. What I am saying though is that if we sin, we love our sin more than we love God. Just like Adam and Eve traded out their being with God for this other thing, When we sin, we trade out our relationship. We undervalue the relationship that we have with God and we trade it out for something else, for some other promise that we think can fulfill us. And the reason that we don't love God more is because we don't know him. A few weeks ago, I shared that Stephanie and I had just celebrated our 15th anniversary. Now, I I love my wife a whole lot, and I loved her a lot 15 years ago. But those of you who've been married for a while, some of you maybe even longer than we have, you'll understand the truth that I'm about to say. And that is that I love my wife more today than I did 15 years ago. You say, well, how can that be true? Well, I mean, maybe I had a little bit more romantic love then than I do now, but I know so much more about my wife. There's so much more that I can love that I didn't even know about 15 years ago. I didn't know her as a wife. I didn't know her as a partner. I didn't know her as a mom. I didn't know her as a professional. I didn't know her in so many other places of her life that now I love her in. And the only way I was able to develop that knowing was by spending time with her. We don't know God because we don't spend time with God. I think you can begin to see this ugly cycle that develops. I sin because I don't love God enough. I don't love God enough because I don't spend enough time with him. And I don't spend enough time with God because, well, let's just cut to the bottom line of it all, I don't feel like I need it. What if I had started my marriage with a vow to only spend one hour a week with my new wife? And then anytime I had some needs, that I would come to her to get those needs met. Yeah, yeah, I think we all understand that none of those needs would ever be getting met. Yeah, you're exactly right. But if I was to ask you this question, Do you think that spending time with God is a good thing? I bet the majority of you would probably be like, yeah, absolutely, spending time with God is a good thing. Sure. And if I was to ask you, do you believe or do you think that spending time with God has the ability or could change your life? I think, again, most of you would probably agree with that. But if I was to ask you, If spending time with God was vital or necessity for you to live, I don't know that as many of you would agree with that. Because somewhere along the line, 
somewhere along the line, we have come to believe that spending time with God is optional. I mean, I, I guess it is optional. If, if you consider breathing and eating as optional things to our life's existence, then sure, spending time with God should be optional for you too. But your relationship with God, if you only spend one hour a week with him, or if you only spend two Sundays a month with him, at best case is on life support. It may be dead. And really the bottom line of that is is that that's a, a pride thing for us. Pride says that I can do it on my own and I don't need your help, God, or your church. In other words, I've got this. I can do it. You know, Jesus had something to say about this in John chapter 15, verse 5. He's talking about the, the vine again. And Jesus says that apart from me, you can do nothing. I think we mistake that verse for saying that apart from God, we can do big things all on our own. In fact, all we need is just a little bit of him and we can run for, we can hypermile for a really long time and we can do all of these incredible things in his name and he'll be so proud of us if we can do all of these things all on our own and show him how amazing we are and how much devotion we have for him, how much love that we have by all of the stuff that we've done. That's not true. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, said that what we really need to do is we need to flip this paradigm upside down. Check out what he says in his book to his church, James chapter 4. It says this. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So instead of ending with pride, We start with humility. Humility is another Latin word, and it means low. And so instead of a a view of, I can do everything on my own, humility is this view of, I need God. And what is amazing is when we start here, right? When we start with humility, God pours even more grace onto the fire so that we can come into his presence. Even with sin in our lives, because of that grace, we can come into the presence of a holy God, confess our sins, and spend time with him. And that time with God leads to knowing God. And as we know God, we begin to love God even more. And as we love God more, we begin to keep his commandments. It's obedience. It's the fruit of what happens as we love God. That sure makes what Jesus said in his greatest sermon as he opened up with all of these how to be happy statements. Because Jesus said in Matthew Five, happy are those who are humble, for God will give them the whole world. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. I pray that it would sink in that we are not supposed to do, but instead we're supposed to fight just to be in your presence. God, I understand that even when we lose against our our, our nature, our sin nature, uh, help us to understand that we've surrendered that to you and that we can come back and fight again another day and that 
even with the sin that's in our life, because of the abundance of grace that you pour out, we get to come into your presence and we can confess that sin and we can ask for your forgiveness. And Father, that you'll continue as long as we'll remain humble to pour more grace abundantly upon us so that we can spend time with you and get to know you and fall more in love with you. As we fall more in love with you, Father, we won't continue on in sin. Help us to start from that place of humility instead of ending up in a place of pride. Father, we give you all of the glory and the honor in your name. Amen.